Hey everybody, welcome to Element Church Online. Service is about to begin, so grab your favorite cup of coffee, your Bible, and pull up a stump and enjoy the message. Hi Element Church and happy Palm Sunday. Um, today is the day we uh, recognize as Passion Sunday. Um, it is the beginning of Passion Week and some of us call it the Holy Week. And it is the start of Jesus' journey on his way to the cross and his crucifixion. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them and brought him a donkey in which they placed their cloaks upon it. And Jesus sat on that and rode in and a very large crowd had gathered on the road and laid their cloaks also. And some had cut the branches from the trees and laid them on the road. The crowds then went ahead of him and yelled and shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This is Matthew 21, six through nine. And Palm Sunday serves for us as a preparation of one's heart for the agony of the passion and the joy of his resurrection. Everybody, we are so glad that you're here at Element Church Online. Hey, as always, our big hope today is that you would make Jesus king of your life, that you would take first steps towards him to be a Christ follower today. And for some of us, we hope that you'll take next steps, that you'll look at those areas in your life that desperately need to be touched by the gospel, and that you will grow continually in your relationship with Jesus, taking next steps, getting closer to him every single day. As Kim introduced us uh, to our message today, it is Palm Sunday. And I want to pick out one thing that she shared right at the end. And she said this, her last sentence said this. It said, Palm Sunday serves as a preparation of one's heart for the agony of his passion and the joy of his resurrection. This week, like Kim said, is Passion Week. It is the last few days of Jesus' earthly life. And Palm Sunday is often marked with a lot of worship and a lot of waving of palm branches and just high energy, right? When we read the text, that's what we see. And no doubt there are um, things present in the text that, that, that we see people just losing their minds worshiping Jesus. And we have a lot of reasons to do the same today. We have a lot of reasons to worship God and to worship Jesus because we know the end of the story. We know that he lives. We know that he comes and he saves us from our sins and he, he, he rids us of shame and he makes us right with the Father. Uh, Palm Sunday is marked with tons of really bizarre, really amazing things as Jesus begins to ride in on a donkey <laughs> out of all animals ride in on a donkey on his way to Jerusalem in Mark uh, 11 2 through 6 it said that he Jesus told his disciples he said go to the village in front of you and immediately as you're entering into it you'll find a colt tied which no one has ever sat he says untie it and then bring it to me if anyone says to you why are you doing this say that the Lord has need of it and he will bring it back here immediately and verse 4 says and they went away and found the colt tied to a door outside in the street and they untied it and wouldn't you know verse 5 and some of those standing there said to him hey what are you doing untying that colt and so verse 6 they they told them what jesus had said and they let him go isn't that amazing i mean we could we could camp out right there and just talk about how cool it is that jesus knew where this animal was knew what was going to happen and the disciples found it just like he told them. You know, in Matthew's gospel, it's really cool. The account of the triumphant entry is uh, he, he, he uh, references Zechariah 9.9. 9. Zechariah 9.9 9 is a prophetic word given 500 plus years before Jesus makes his ride toward Jerusalem. And it's about this very event. Isn't that amazing? Zechariah 9.9 9 says this. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Wow! Righteous and having salvation is he humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Isn't, isn't it amazing? Some 500 plus years before Jesus rides in, that was said. And here Jesus is fulfilling prophecy about the Messiah. Man, isn't that amazing? John's gospel uh, says some great things too. But what I really want to get to today 
and this might be different, but what I really want to get to today is Luke's gospel. Luke's account of things that happen in this journey. And I believe it wakes us up to, there's something that Luke talks about in his gospel account that I think wakes us up to something that we don't really talk about on Palm Sunday that I want to talk about today. Um, Luke gives an account of all these things, but when we go four verses deeper after Jesus is riding in on the donkey and people are cutting palm branches down and they're laying them down, making this, this, this makeshift runway for Jesus to go into Jerusalem, after we get past the worship and we get past those things, there, the, the next four verses really put an interesting spin on Palm Sunday. <laughs> and, and so if we go four verses deeper, we see something that, that spins the day in a little bit less of a joyful direction. Here, let, let me read it to you. Luke 19, 41 through 44, four verses. It says, and when they drew near, when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, "What would you, even you, had known of these of this day, the things that make for peace?" He said, "Would that you, even you, had known of this day, the things that make for peace? But now they are hidden from your eyes." In forty three, he says, "For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you." And surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Hey, listen, I do not want to be the pastor who is a Debbie Downer on Palm Sunday. I don't want to be that. But wouldn't it be interesting if we could just look at something that we rarely talk about? on Palm Sunday, at least this year. And let's look at the elephant in the room. Among all the, all the hype and all the worship, Jesus, as he's riding in, the topography changes enough on his journey where he catches a glimpse of the city. And he doesn't rejoice over the city, but he weeps over the city. He weeps over it. And he talks about it being destroyed. He talks about this city not knowing what's happening. He talks about this city just, just being oblivious to what is going on. And he's saddened by that. He's saddened about the destruction that the city of God will soon face. Jesus, what he's talking about here, is actually a prophecy that, that is given out to Daniel before his time. And honestly, it happens. The city is destroyed some 40 years later after Jesus' death and resurrection. And it is said in history that the city was left with not one stone upon another. It was completely obliterated. Now granted, there are so many things in this celebration that I think we don't really talk about a lot. I mean, I mean, just the fact that Jesus, even though he's the Messiah and the King, he comes in on a donkey. Come on, y'all. A donkey? Like, if Jesus came to my house and was like, hey, I want to make an entrance into Hayward. I want to make an entrance into your city. I would be like, well, there's the donkey. <laughs> I would call some of you guys that have these majestic horses, these amazing beasts, and I would say, oh, I'll get you something really cool to ride in on. I wouldn't be like, well, there's a donkey over there, like, eating trash. <laughs> But he rides in on a donkey, not an not a, a animal of war, but an animal of humility. And it was prophesied that he would. You know, the crowd is there. Now, it's interesting about the crowd because the crowd doesn't gather because they heard Jesus was coming. The crowd is actually gathering for another reason. They're gathering because there's a celebration going on in the city. The celebration, the, the, the commemoration called Passover, which is a whole other issue. But the crowd is there, and they're cheering him on, and they, we, we can see that it's an impromptu party because they're cutting, they didn't come prepared with ribbons and stuff. They're cutting down palm branches, and yeah, that was, that was a sign of victory too, but like they're laying down their garments. I mean, these aren't wealthy people. These aren't, these aren't people of high esteem. These are common people. And they're, they're just laying down their jackets and their coats, cutting down some, some palm tree branches and laying them down and waving them. Hey, Jesus! So Passover, they're there for Passover. They're not really there for him. I mean, it's, a, it's an added bonus. But think about this for a minute. Passover? Like Passover? 
Do you remember what Passover is? When you look back in Exodus, when the people of God were enslaved by Egypt, God came, and you remember, he told Pharaoh through the voice of Moses, right? He said, let his people go. Pharaoh didn't do it, so some plagues came. And the last plague had to do with death of a firstborn. And so God told the people of Israel, his people, he said, listen, if your life, if you, if you want to save your life, if you want to save the life of your firstborn, if you don't want this plague to hit you and to affect you, what you need to do is you need to get a spotless lamb. Listen to this. You need to get a spotless lamb, and you need to kill it. And you need to take the blood of this lamb, and you need to smear it on the outside of your doorpost. The entry of your, to your house, that outside frame, you need to smear the blood on there. And when, when the plague comes and it sees the blood, it will pass over your dwelling, and you'll be safe. But if you don't have the blood of the spotless lamb covering where you are, death, death will come to you. Think about this for a moment, guys. Jesus is riding in on Passover. Uh, do you remember Jesus is called the Lamb of God? He is our sacrifice for sin, and he's riding in on Passover. The, right now, as he's journeying to the city, the city is abuzz with people sacrificing and preparing animals to commemorate Jesus passing over the people of God, saving their life through the death of an animal, of a lamb. This is crazy. And, and, and if it didn't make things any more bizarre, in the middle of this crowd, there are Pharisees, pepper here and there. They're, they're sort of just everywhere. And they're not celebrating with the crowd. Actually, they are probably sneering at Jesus, glaring at him, locking eyes with his eyes, because they're not happy about what's going on. Matter of fact, they're even less happy because what they really want to do is not cheer for him, but they want to destroy him. They want to kill him. But what's interesting about this whole thing is that nobody really realizes what's going on. The people are misled. The disciples themselves are perplexed. They're a little dumbstruck by all this. Because at one point, the people wanted to make Jesus king, and Jesus said no. And I can only imagine then the disciples are like, well, that sounds like a good gig to be king. Why doesn't he want to be king? And so now he's allowing himself to be worshipped that way. And they're a little perplexed perplexed about that they don't understand what's really going on but of course they enter into it because let's face it if you're one of the inner crowd if you're friends of jesus sometimes you just go with the flow the crowd is a little misled sure they're worshiping jesus and jesus should be worshiped but their motivation of their heart is way different than what it should be see they're worshiping jesus jesus as a physical ruler as someone who will come and deliver them, deliver them from a tyrant government, not someone who is coming to deliver them from eternal death and damnation. The crowd is misled, and the Pharisees obviously are preoccupied. They don't even care about what's going on around them. All they care about is killing Jesus. They got, get a, they got to get rid of this guy who is a threat to their system, who is a threat to their structures, a threat to their own sort of piece of the pie of the Roman government. And then all the while, the city is abuzz of Passover. Animals are being slaughtered and fires are being kindled. And, and there's Jesus, the Passover lamb. And he's there, the Messiah. Like, this is what Zechariah prophesied about 500 plus years before and, there he is. It's happening right now. He's, he's here. The Messiah is here. The King is here. The Savior is here. And they miss it. They miss it. We, we miss it. We miss it. So I want us to remember why Jesus is weeping over the city today. Because I don't want to live, I don't want us to live our lives missing this or, or misinterpreting who Jesus is or being misled in our worship. It is a joyful occasion, but we, we can't ignore that during the joyful worship, during the joyful celebration, Jesus 
wept. We can't just skip over that and pretend it's not there. It's there, and it's right there after the account of his entry into Jerusalem. And so we have to be aware that, that what we're looking at is, is not just a partial gospel, but the whole gospel. I want us to remember Jesus weeping over the city and, and, and why he's doing it. The short answer is this, is that Jerusalem was supposed to be the city that loves God. Supposed to be the city that welcomes the Messiah. Jerusalem is, it was the city that uh, Zechariah talked about. Do you remember what it said? Zechariah 9 9. Let me just read this to you again. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. They're supposed to be the ones that welcome in the Messiah, that welcome in the king. But the city, unfortunately, has forgotten about God. The city has forgotten, forgotten about their need for God. It's not the city that will welcome the Messiah. It actually, now it's the city that will kill the Messiah. And Jesus is upset about that. It breaks his heart that as he sees the city come into view, that though this should be a joyful occasion, it is really not one. It is a a moment of reality for Jesus. That his journey won't end the way it is right now. That it won't end the way it began. The people that are shouting and proclaiming his name will sing a different tune some days from now. The people of the city have misinterpreted who the Messiah is and they've misplaced their need to be right with God. They're more concerned about being liberated from a tyrant government than being liberated from their sins. Man, they, they exchanged freedom from sin for freedom from government. They exchanged freedom, freedom from sin and death and hell and damnation from just free us from this government. Make things right again so that we can be more comfortable and more at ease. They misinterpret the king of glory for a ruler that will liberate them from just a physical adversary. This is tragic. No wonder Jesus is weeping in this moment. And remember the Pharisees? There they are. They're in the crowd. Not cheering, not happy, but they're plotting. There are people in the crowd right now, and the only thing on their mind is death. And again, I think Jesus sees them. I wonder if Jesus locked eyes with them, staring at them as they stared back. And as they glared at him, he was the only one. He was the only one. Jesus was the only one that knew that their hate for him actually had a place in the plan of God for his life. That's amazing. Jesus weeps over the city because he knows that they will turn their back on him. He weeps over the city because he loves them and wishes and hopes that they would love him back. He weeps over the city because the ones who have come, the ones who have come to worship him are going to be the ones that will treat him like a criminal. He weeps over the city because they will finally they're finally going to have their chance to see the Messiah and they'll miss it they'll misinterpret they'll, they'll, most, they'll mistake him for a criminal and a tyrant and a rebel and they'll crucify him and Jesus will give them no reason to think this but yet they'll be swayed into believing it because they've missed it in the middle of the cheering of the crowd, I can only imagine that Jesus' heart breaks because he knows what is going to be... He, he knows what's going to happen and what he's already started by getting on that donkey and riding towards Jerusalem can't be undone. It's over. 
as soon as he told those disciples go get that donkey and they brought it back and they put their coats on top of it and he jumped up on that on that animal and he began to make his way to as soon as he started making his way to jerusalem that was the gauntlet that was the end or excuse me the beginning of the end for jesus nothing could be undone at that time nor will it be undone it was over and so in the middle of all this worship i can only imagine that that is the thing that is going through jesus's heart as he weeps over the city there's no turning back now so let our worship today not just be stereotypical traditional palm branch there's nothing wrong with that but like let's let's mix it with some sorrow and i know that sounds horrible to say but i really believe it'll make palm sunday mean more to us if we'll step back for a moment and realize what's happening right here in our passage something that the people can't see that thankfully we can sorrow because we know now that, that 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 we see the pain of our savior the pain that he must have felt as he deliberately makes his way to the he he deliberately makes his way to the cross knowing what is to befall him that should make you a little sorrowful shouldn't it i mean i i understand what his death does i understand that it liberates us but it's still the death of the king of glory the crucifixion is not glamorous it is horrible but with sorrow we dump joy inside of that as well joy because we're thankful he didn't waver in his pursuit towards us i'm thankful that that jesus as he called for the donkey and as he sat there and looked at it as people as his disciples were preparing it that that for a moment he just looked at it and and i'm thankful he didn't go you know i don't think i want to do this <laughs> He knew it was going to happen, and he did it anyway. We're joyful and we're thankful because he chose to die for us even while we mistaken him to be someone he's not. How many times have we mistaken Jesus for someone he's not? I don't know how many times in my life I just called him a good guy. He had great things to say. He's a good man. I was just like the people in the city right here. That I was fine with saying that he was a prophet and wise, but... I wasn't fine with calling him a Messiah and my king. But we've mistaken him. We need to be joyful that he continues to die for us. He continues to go to the, to the cross and die for us, even though we rebel against him, even though our worship has turned to crucify him. Even though we've hated him and refused him in our life, he is still choosing to lay his life down for us. Wow. Wow. We're joyful because we're thankful to be on this side of the cross, knowing that the road to the cross leads to salvation and an empty tomb. I don't know about you, but I am thankful I did not live in this day and age. I'm thankful that I wasn't in the crowd, buying into the hype of worship, not knowing who I was actually looking at. Some people say, oh, I just wish I could live in Jesus' day. Not me. Nope. <laughs> I'm glad I'm on this side. I'm thankful. I'm thankful that I have these accounts of the gospel that, that help me rightly interpret who Jesus is. That he's, he's, not a, he's not a governor or a president who's come to liberate me from a social system. He's the king, the promise, the lamb of God to be sacrificed for my life because I'm worth it to him. That, I, that my life means that much to God. That he loves me so much that he would give the God of heaven and earth would give me his son to make me right with him, to bring me into his family. Wow. Like Jerusalem, we need to understand that we are built to be an inhabitant of the king of glory. Like Jerusalem, you and me, we've been created to welcome the king in. Our heart is like the entryway to our lives and our gates should be open and we should welcome in the King of glory. And like Jerusalem, let me tell you something, we have to be real. Like Jerusalem, we have all strayed away. And we've all misrepresented, uh, misrepresented and not represented well the King. 
but there's hope. There's hope today. Aren't you thankful for hope? I mean, let's face it, even in the crowd, even though they believed Jesus to be something that he really wasn't, they were hopeful. Even though their hope was misplaced, they were hopeful. At least now we know. Now we have a greater hope. There's hope today because today is our Palm Sunday. Today is our Palm Sunday. And the good news is this, is that Jesus is still riding towards us today. Regardless of your mistakes, regardless of what you've done, regardless of your misrepresentation of the gospel of, or, or, or your misinterpretation of, of who Jesus is, regardless of how, your attitude and how it's been towards the King of glory, He is still riding towards you today. And there is nothing, nothing that can stop His pursuit now. Just like when He was riding into Jerusalem knowing that it could not be undone. Let me tell you something, friend. He's riding towards you right now. He's knocking on the door of your heart, asking for you to open up the gates of your life, to allow Him in, and He is there, and He is not looking to undo it. So what do we do with this? It's very simple. This is our Palm Sunday. This is the day that we celebrate the King of Glory riding towards His people to lay down His life, to set us free. For a moment, let's lay down our palm branches and hit our knees and acknowledge that, that this had to be really hard for our King. But let's don't stay in sorrow. Let's remember that He is powerful and He's loving. And He, even though it was hard for Him and even though He wept over the city, He still ran to her. What is our response? Let's don't be the city that rejects God. Let's be a city that opens our lives to God. Let's welcome the Messiah in so that He can change everything. Can I pray for you? God, I thank you that you are good to us. God, we're grateful that you don't stop your pursuit of who we are. As long as we have breath in our being, you are continually pursuing us. Help us to stop running from you. <laughs> Help us to unlock the gates to our lives and to let you in so that we can be born again, so that we can find peace, hope, mercy and grace and forgiveness. Thank you, God, for today. Thank you, God, for Palm Sunday. Thank you for continuing to come after us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you guys. Hope you have a great Palm Sunday. Thanks again for joining us today. Remember to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. If you would like to give or have a prayer request, please visit us at our website, www.theelement.cc. Or you can reach Wade Bishop at his personal cell phone, 715... Just kidding. Have a good week, guys. Stay connected.